die Arbeit mit anderen Parteien an. Also ist es typisch. One murderous policy defined the Third Reich. The cold-blooded murder of millions of European Jews in the most horrific crime in history. It was a genocide of unequalled cruelty and ferocity. Mass killing on an industrial scale. Keeping a watchful eye over it all was the Führer's closest advisor, Martin Bormann. Bormann's sinister influence at the heart of the Nazi regime made him a leading conspirator in all their most heinous war crimes. He was not only Hitler's money man, but also the loyal party enforcer whose job was to keep the Führer's name free from any taint of murder. But when the war ended, he would vanish into the Berlin night. One of the most important Nazis just went missing. It was the start of a manhunt that would last decades. He would be chased by the Allied authorities, a top Oxford University historian, the world's media, and when all the others had given up, the most famous Nazi hunter ever, Simon Wiesenthal. In the end, one of Nazi hunting's biggest and most enduring mysteries ever would only be solved when cutting-edge science determined once and for all what really happened to Hitler's missing deputy. April 29th, 1945, Berlin. Hitler's Third Reich was on its knees. The city had been flattened by years of sustained Allied bombing. Hardly a landmark escaped being hit during the Allied air attacks. Only the outer frames of buildings remain upright. Bomb blasts dumped floors into cellars and blew off the roofs of the structures. Adolf Hitler, Führer of the once mighty Third Reich, had boasted it would last a thousand years. This was now the reality. Weakened and confused after years of war, Hitler made one of his final appearances in front of the cameras. He could now only await his fate in his Führer bunker beneath the Reich Chancellery, surrounded by his most loyal supporters. Among them, his most feared henchman his sinister enforcer and deputy, Martin Bormann. Bormann refused to leave his master's side and pledged to stay with him in the besieged city, his leader's faithful shadow. In the early hours of April the 30th, as the Russians advanced ever closer, Hitler married his 33-year-old longtime companion, Eva Brown, in a civil wedding ceremony in the bunker. The newlyweds said their farewells to their entourage, including Martin Bormann, and that afternoon ended their lives. With the Führer gone, a hopeless power vacuum opened up in the Reich Chancellery bunker. 
In his will, Adolf Hitler named Joseph Goebbels Reich Chancellor and Martin Bormann as party secretary. He had now reached the summit of his career. Nazi party leader. And together with Joseph Goebbels, he made one last desperate attempt to save the situation. They made contact with Russian headquarters to try to negotiate a ceasefire. It was coldly rejected. Nothing less than total unconditional surrender would be accepted. At street level, Russian troops ruthlessly wiped out any resistance now mainly made up of exhausted old men and frightened boys. The war was lost. For Joseph Goebbels, it was all over. He would choose death over the disgrace of capture. Having poisoned their six young children, Goebbels and his wife Magda committed suicide on the evening of the 1st of May, 1945. But Martin Bormann would have none of it. He had no intention of committing suicide. Instead, he decided to make a break for it before the Russians got him. Seizing his chance, Bormann joined Hitler's physician, Ludwig Stumpfeger, Arthur Axman, former head of the Hitler Youth, and Hans Bauer, Hitler's personal pilot. Just after midnight, they made their way to the surface and disappeared into the night in the direction of Berlin's Lechter station. Within hours, Berlin fell to the Russians. The red victory banner was raised over the Reichstag. Russians arrived at Hitler's bunker on May the 2nd. All they found was the dictator's badly charred body with his new wife laying beside him, burnt beyond recognition and tossed into a shallow grave. Nearby were the bodies of Joseph Goebbels and his family. Frustrated, they switched their attention to Hitler's missing henchman, Martin Bormann the last high-profile Nazi known to have been in the bunker until the last minute. So where was he now? Bormann was nowhere to be seen. He had disappeared into the chaos of the fallen city and vanished without trace. Resulting in a mystery which would last for years to come and one of the biggest manhunts in history. So who exactly was Martin Bormann? Where had he come from? And how had he climbed so far and so fast in the Nazi hierarchy? Martin Bormann was born in 1900 in Wegerleben in Imperial Prussia. The son of a post office worker, Bormann was a school dropout and moved between a string of temporary jobs. In the years after World War I, Germany collapsed into disorder and ruin. Poverty and discontent boiled over into mass unrest. There were riots on the streets. 
and political extremism grew. Bormann fell under its spell. In the 1920s, he served as a treasurer in the Fry Corps, a brutal right-wing paramilitary group that became increasingly political. At 23, he spent a year in prison for his part in the murder of an elementary school teacher he thought had been stealing funds. When he was released, he found the political landscape of Germany had changed. Bormann, now aged 24, found his vocation in politics as part of Adolf Hitler's Nazi party. He patiently worked his way up through the ranks. By 1925, he had become a local party press officer. The former dropout was a man on the up, and soon he would marry. He met Gerda Busch, the daughter of Major Walter Busch, a longtime friend of Adolf Hitler. They were married on September the 2nd, 1929, with none other than Adolf Hitler acting as a witness. Gerda would have a powerful influence on Bormann. She hated the Catholic Church and was a rabid anti-Semite. It meant that when the Nazi persecution of the Jews began in the 1930s, Bormann helped fan the flames. The National Socialists are überhaupt nicht Deutsch. Denn sie lehnen die Arbeit mit anderen Parteien ab. Also ist es typisch deutsch, 30 Parteien zu besitzen. Ich habe hier eine zu erklären, die Herren haben ganz recht. Wir sind intolerant. Ich habe mir ein Ziel gesteckt, nämlich die 30 Parteien aus Deutschland hinauszufegen. In 1933, with Hitler now Chancellor of Germany, Bormann was on the rise. He had become a Reichsleiter, or government minister, one of a small elite with direct access to the Führer, a situation he relished. He supervised various grandiose building projects, including Hitler's summer residence, the Berghof. He also made the dictator personally very rich by extorting money from German industrialists for a so-called special endowment fund. He made sure sales of Hitler's autobiography, Mein Kampf, topped the bestsellers list a copy was given to all newlyweds on their wedding day. And he charged royalties on stamps bearing Hitler's image. Hitler was now the millionaire, Bormann, the hard-working money man. Martin Bormann was fast becoming an invaluable member of the Führer's entourage. September 1939, war was declared. Hitler's aggressive expansion into Europe finally provoked all-out conflict. 
As Germany's armies captured country after country in 1939 to 1940, Hitler's henchmen would find war the perfect backdrop to his finest hour. In May 1941, Bormann took over from Rudolf Hess as head of the party chancellery and effectively as Hitler's deputy. Two years later, Bormann was given, in his eyes, an even more prestigious role, Hitler's official secretary. He controlled almost every aspect of the dictator's working life, from screening his appointments to handling documents that went across his desk. Now at the top of his game, within the competing factions vying for the Führer's attentions, Bormann occupied a prime position, deputy and secretary. He had become Hitler's shadow. It was a role that made him extremely unpopular. His proximity to Hitler made him some dangerous enemies. They included Hermann Goering, who had always seen himself as Hitler's successor. Goering despised Bormann as a lower-class thug, but as long as Bormann remained Hitler's favorite, there was nothing he could do about it. Meanwhile, Bormann reveled in Goering's discomfort. But it was his role in the murder of millions of Jews that made Martin Bormann one of the Nazis' most wanted war criminals. He became one of the most enthusiastic supporters of what would be known as the Final Solution, Hitler's policy of mass extermination. Initially, the Führer's conquering armies in the east were followed by Einsatzgruppen, brutal gangs of murderers who summarily executed thousands of Jews and undesirables. The problem the Nazis faced was by conquering so much extra land, they had acquired four million unwanted Jews. They needed a solution on an industrial scale. Bormann was the project go-between, making sure the Führer's name remained clean. He was the faithful manager and fixer for his idol. From 1942 onwards, Jews, Gypsies and other groups from all across Europe were transported to specially constructed camps. There, they were ruthlessly worked to death or gassed in one of the most gruesomely efficient genocides of all time. Bormann would spend much of his time working with Gestapo and SS chief Heinrich Himmler. They would liaise directly over the progress of the final solution. Bormann would pore over Himmler's reports as the horrifying numbers mounted. On one occasion, Himmler used the word extermination instead of the code word resettled on an open phone line to describe the death 
of 40,000 Jews in Poland. Bormann was furious at the indiscretion. In future, all such reports were to be made through SS couriers or radio. There would be no more phone calls. But what Bormann didn't realize was that thanks to the cracking of the German Enigma codes, the Allies were already intercepting Nazi radio traffic and building their dossier on Martin Bormann. His role at the heart of Hitler's terror machine was well documented. By 1943, his master's war wasn't going according to plan. Germany had suffered crippling defeats across numerous fronts. In the deserts of Africa, in Italy, and Russia. As the progress of the war started to falter, Bormann had become so close to Hitler that the Führer regarded him as central to his success. To win this war, I need Bormann, he protested in a 1943 meeting. But by the autumn of 1944, the war was going badly. The Allies had invaded mainland Europe and were now fighting their way towards Berlin. Hitler's troops were dying in their thousands, in both the West and in the East. The retreating Germans destroyed anything of value to the enemy. From now on, it's their own land for a change the Germans are destroying. In a desperate attempt to shore up his rapidly dwindling defences, Hitler gave Bormann another role, to head up the Volkssturm. Made up of ill-equipped ragtag units of old men and boys, Bormann's new militia army was meant to hold back the Red Hordes with little more than throwaway weapons. Bormann was out of his depth. There would be little he or the Volkssturm could do to stop defeat. Remember your enemy. Remember these camps and the scores like them where the Nazis tortured, starved, mutilated and murdered people for one sin, the sin that they were non-Germans. For the victorious Allies, bringing those responsible for the atrocities of the Holocaust to justice was of utmost importance. Nazis of all ranks would be held to account as part of a crucial process of retribution. As the Third Reich was dismantled, the Allies settled on a judicial process to bring the former regime to account. Many leading Nazis, including Martin Bormann, were going to be put on trial before an international military war crimes tribunal. So Bormann had to be found. More than 200,000 leaflets were distributed throughout Germany. Radio broadcasts and newspaper announcements were also made. British Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden 
stated the greatest manhunt is underway from Norway to the Bavarian Alps. One theory was that when Bormann fled the bunker, he may have headed north to Flensburg near the Danish border. It was enough for British intelligence agents to begin a search. But a thorough combing of the area yielded nothing. So Dick White, a leading MI6 intelligence officer, decided to put a dedicated investigation team in place. It was headed by a British Army intelligence officer, Major Hugh Trevor Roper. Trevor Roper, an Oxford University historian, had arrived in Germany in November 1945 to investigate claims that Hitler was alive and well and hiding in the Austrian mountains. On his return to Berlin, Trevor Roper determined to discover the truth behind Bormann's mysterious disappearance. He was especially interested in one of Bormann's fellow escapees. Arthur Axman, the former head of the Hitler Youth. Axman claimed that Bormann had died shortly after leaving the bunker and that he'd seen his lifeless body. But Bormann's corpse had never been found. So where was the proof? It meant Bormann could still be alive. So Trevor Roper investigated another theory, that Bormann had in fact escaped to Bolzano in northern Italy to join his wife Gerda. But Gerda had died from cancer in April 1946 after being taken ill at a US internment camp. If she did know the whereabouts of her renegade husband, she took her story with her to the grave. So once again, the focus would return to Berlin. Trevor Roper realized that without a body, he would have to admit defeat. The case went cold, and Trevor Roper moved on. But despite his absence, Martin Bormann was one of the key defendants at the military tribunal. Behind the cold, gray facade of this courthouse in Nuremberg, the greatest trial drama of our times begins. Here, the governments of France, Russia, Great Britain, and the United States, representing civilization, oppose the top 20 leaders of an aggressor nation. The big Nazis are being charged with mass crimes against humanity. The trial opened in late 1945. Bormann, along with more than 20 others, was charged with war crimes and crimes against humanity. Bormann's counsel could offer only one real defense. That Bormann had died in the ruins of Berlin in the final hours of the Third Reich. A dead man, he argued, cannot be tried. As testimony, he used evidence from Hitler's entourage. Ich rechne zu dieser Gruppe noch Himmler und Bormann. Wer aber sonst in diesem engen Vertrauenskreis gewesen ist, weiß ich nicht. But as he gazed at Bormann's empty seat in the dock, Sir David Maxwell Fife, one of the chief prosecutors, told the court, there is still the clear possibility that he is alive. The judges agreed with him. Bormann was found guilty. 
the missing man was sentenced to death in absentia in October 1946. The trouble was, rumors that Borman was alive just wouldn't go away. Some claimed he'd gone to ground on a farm deep in the German countryside. Others said he was holed up in a remote Spanish village. Some even said he was in Egypt. The more the rumors circulated, the more people were convinced that Borman was still alive. Now the FBI became involved. Almost every report, no matter how outlandish, was followed up by its agents. They would throw the focus of their search onto Argentina. Under the orders of J. Edgar Hoover, agents were dispatched to find the missing Nazi. And you must realize that no case ever ends for the Federal Bureau of Investigation until it is solved and closed with the conviction of the guilty or the acquittal of the innocent. One story was that Bormann was in Rome, posing as a Franciscan monk, a ludicrous suggestion given his hatred of the Catholic Church. Unsurprisingly, that claim turned out to be fantasy. In the 1950s, Allied HQ in Berlin would follow up a number of additional leads. Another of Bormann's fellow bunker escapees, Werner Naumann, told the British military police that Bormann had been a spy for the Russians and was living in Moscow. So now, the CIA joined the hunt, but it failed to find any concrete evidence he was still alive in Moscow or anywhere else. The case, once again, went cold. The CIA concluded that Bormann had died as he tried to escape from Berlin. This was again corroborated in October 1955 by Heinz Linger, formerly Hitler's valet. Released after 10 years in a Russian prisoner of war camp, he stated categorically that Bormann was dead. The following year, SS Major Otto Ginscher, Hitler's adjutant during the last days in the bunker, also confirmed this version. The official search seemed to be over, the conclusion that Bormann had died hours after leaving the bunker. But neither Linger or Genscher could say where or how he had perished. And apart from Axman, no one had seen Bormann's body, a body that was still missing. The dossier seemed to be closed. One man, however, refused to accept the official line. The most famous Nazi hunter of them all, Simon Wiesenthal. Wiesenthal had been imprisoned in a dozen camps since the summer of 1941, ending the war at Mauthausen in Austria. U.S. troops from General George S. Patton's Third Army arrived at Mauthausen, the last camp to be liberated, on May the 5th, 1945. Wiesenthal and a few other survivors were found barely alive, surrounded by corpses. In the day of liberation, I could not walk. But I wish to see the sun. I wish to see the, the American tank. And all four, I was come out from the block and look on the American flag. 
I feel that every star, this is a star of justice, and this is a star of friendship, and this is a star of culture, and the stripes, this is a road to freedom. He had experienced firsthand the barbaric reality of Hitler's final solution, a policy that Martin Bormann had personally endorsed and that had so nearly killed him. So when Germany finally surrendered, Wiesenthal's own war had only just begun. After the war, there was an orgy of violence and vigilante justice against the Nazis, but Wiesenthal wanted something different. He would track down the guilty, no matter where they were, and make sure that they stood trial for their crimes. And Martin Bormann would be in his sights. He started by working for the United States War Crimes Unit in Austria, compiling evidence against former Nazis. They say to me, you, see, you wish to help us. You know a lot. You want to down it, everything what you know. I say, OK. By 1947, he had set up the Jewish Documentation Center in Vienna, staffed by around 30 volunteers. They painstakingly began to build up not only records relating to the Holocaust, but evidence against their targets. Wiesenthal was aided by a vast network of informants, friends, and sympathizers. These included German veterans appalled by the horrors they had witnessed. He even received intelligence from Nazis with grudges against other former colleagues. Wiesenthal would slowly refine the documents, disparate facts and testimonies into hard and fast cases. And high on his list of fugitives from justice remained the name of Martin Bormann. Throughout the late 1940s and 50s, more sightings of Hitler's missing deputy occurred in South America. In Guatemala, Ecuador, Brazil, Bolivia, Paraguay, Chile, and Argentina. Rumors that top Nazis had been smuggled into Latin America through a network of spies and sympathizers had begun almost as soon as Germany surrendered. Some claimed that they had escaped justice by crossing the Atlantic in submarines laden with secret documents, precious treasures, and Nazi gold. These South American Bormann sightings seemed to point to such a network. The sightings immediately aroused the interest of Wiesenthal. Throughout the 1950s, he continued his investigations into Bormann, but he could never be entirely convinced he was still alive. In 1954, disaster struck. The Jewish Documentation Center was forced to close its doors because of a lack of funds. It seemed the mystery of Martin Bormann would go on, and Wiesenthal's dossier abandoned. Then, an event occurred that would change his fortunes. In May 1960, Israeli Secret Service agents captured the notorious Nazi Adolf Eichmann and smuggled him back to Jerusalem. Adolf, the Marshal Adolf Karl Eichmann, 
they'd found him living in a quiet suburb of Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina. The job of this commander was to erase any sign of the murdering of the people by the Nazis. The successful conviction of Eichmann was a huge boost for Wiesenthal. Especially as the Israeli Secret Service gave him credit for the find. Funds now poured into Wiesenthal's Jewish Documentation Center in Vienna. He could now focus solely and exclusively on finding Nazi war criminals. The hunt was back on. A number of high-profile successes followed, including Franz Stangl, commander of the death camps at Treblinka and Sobobor, Karl Schilberbauer, the Gestapo officer who arrested Anne Frank, and female prison camp guard Hermina Braunsteiner Ryan. But one target on his most wanted war criminals list was still unaccounted for, Martin Bormann. Do you think Bormann and the other major Nazis will be caught someday? I am not a prophet. This is open cases for me, an open case. I cannot much tell you about it. Are you going to do everything possible to, yes, to get Bormann? Well, against Bormann, against others. In 1964, the West German government put a $30,000 price on his head. For a while, Wiesenthal was convinced Bormann was in Brazil and alerted the authorities. But nothing was done, leaving Wiesenthal to remark bitterly in 1967 that no country will want to attempt a second Eichmann case. Bormann will come to his end someday, and the West German reward will never be paid. Various unsuccessful cases were brought against men alleged to be Bormann, but the men, including Johann Hartmann in 1972, were acquitted. Similarly, more claims that Bormann was in hiding in northern Argentina in the early 1970s came to nothing. But in the end, something happened that was so dramatic, it made even Wiesenthal change his mind once and for all about what had actually happened to Martin Bormann. In 1965, the Frankfurt public prosecutor authorized a dig at the last known location of Martin Bormann's body. It was the spot identified by Arthur Axman years earlier, beneath Berlin's Lechte railway station. Despite trying to operate in utmost secrecy, the story broke. The international press, still fascinated by the Bormann hunt, descended on the scene. But disappointingly, nothing was found. There the matter might have rested but for one crucial breakthrough in late 1972. It was to be a massive twist in the search for Martin Bormann. Acting on a tip-off from a friend, a German journalist, Jochen von Lang, learned that building work was due to begin on the site near the Lechter station, where he suspected the body of Martin Bormann lay. He alerted the authorities, and in December 1972, there was a sensational development. Workmen unearthed two skeletons, one from a small man, another from a much taller man. Forensic evidence would now come into play. 
The shorter skeleton was 170 centimeters long, the same height as Martin Bormann. The teeth matched his dental records, as recorded by Professor Hugo Blaschke, his dentist. Glass splinters in the jaw area pointed to suicide by cyanide capsules. Other bone injuries noted in the skeleton tallied with known accidents in Borman's past. Finally, plastic facial remodeling created a strong likeness to the notorious Borman. In 1973, the case of Martin Borman was officially closed. Reluctantly, Wiesenthal had to accept the verdict, although doubts still lingered. Dr. Wiesenthal, do you now accept the death of Martin Bormann as a fact? Uh, I must do that because the uh, prosecutor uh, closed the file and say that he will not in the future accept any information about Bormann. And today uh, he presents us a lot of arguments so the only difference between us are that I am speaking about a big possibility that Bormann are dead, and they say this is absolutely true. But still there was a problem. Sightings of Bormann apparently continued in South America. Yo le he visto en una oportunidad en un baile in una casa que no quisiera dar el nombre, ¿verdad? Era un señor alto, de muy buena presencia. Eh, aquí en el Paraguay siempre se tuvo una simpatía muy especial los nazis, se la apreciaba mucho. In the end, it was cutting edge science that would have the last word. DNA testing became a key tool in forensic science. This groundbreaking profiling method would now be used on the skeleton. In 1998, a DNA test using a sample from an 83-year-old relative proved beyond doubt that the remains were those of Bormann. There was now no doubt. It was now possible to piece together the last minutes of Bormann's life. After his escape from the Führer bunker in 1945, he had made it through the war-torn streets of the capital. As the battle raged all around, he had attempted to evade capture and make his way out of the city via Lechter Station. But as Russian tanks and patrols bore down on his position, Martin Bormann must have realized the game was up. There could be no escape, so he took a cyanide capsule. His body lay unidentified for days before being moved by a burial party and thrown into a makeshift grave just meters from where he had originally lain. There he would remain undiscovered for decades. It was only with the discovery of his skeleton in 1972 and the positive DNA match 26 years later that the true story of what happened to Martin Bormann was known. Despite decades of wild and imaginative sightings, incessant rumors and determined chases, the truth had always been hidden under the streets of Berlin. The story of Martin Bormann could finally be put to rest. At last there was closure for the countless victims of Hitler's henchmen.